This is the Mark Dolan Way. Top tips for mind, body and soul, some great life hacks and my favourite products of the week. This show is available on all podcast platforms or you can watch it. Just subscribe to the Mark Dolan Way on YouTube and join the Facebook group. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show. I hope you are very well. Here is a game-changing piece of advice. Just do one thing. We've all got a million tasks, but only empty the dishwasher. Only send that email. Only make that important work call. Just think of tasks in their singularity. And this works brilliantly as you go about your day. So if you want to improve yourself in your day, then just focus on one thing. So just think for today, I'm going to be on time. I'm not going to do any other good things, but I will just be on time for all of the different appointments I've got. Or maybe just for today, I'm going to be positive about everything. So I'll look at negatives and I will turn them into a positive. Um, it might be that for one day, you're only going to challenge orthodoxy, that you're going to push back, that you're going to start saying no. That can be the thing that you do for that one day. So whatever it is that's going on in your life, just focus on one element each day and nail that. Now, challenging orthodoxy is something that really has been the essence of human history. Uh, whether it's politics or any other philosophy, humanity is the battle of ideas. It's the yin and the yang. It's the left versus right, red versus blue. Now, when it comes to politics, I've got something very healing to say, which is that we know that everyone's very tribal these days. You're on the left, you're on the right, maybe you're in the center. The bottom line is we need all of them. You need the left, you need the right. And it's just that in the course of the history, you have a bit of right for a few years, then you have a bit of left. And that is generally the pattern of human progress, the competition of ideas, which is why dictatorships are a problem because they don't allow for that. And ideology is a problem philosophically because it doesn't allow again for the competition of other ideas. Ideology by definition does not bend to a different view. Um, so that's the essence of it um, is that uh, everything is an idea and then you have a counter idea and that's how we move forward. And you can benefit from that yourself. OK, and the way that you do that is that you look at everything that's going on around you and you look at your own life and your own work situation, your own family relationships, love, and you just challenge authority and look at everything in 360. OK, and I'm going to give you some business examples of that. So let's talk about an Irish airline called Ryanair. Now, this was a low cost budget airline, which really changed the face of aviation under its founder and CEO, Michael O'Leary, who's a very feisty character, a real personality and, and, and very forceful and interesting guy. Well, he changed the world. And how and why did he do that? Well, because he challenged orthodoxy. So he looked at the airline industry and he thought, this is rubbish how, how, uh, how it's currently being done. And he revolutionized it with some ideas that people thought were bonkers. So first of all, the, you know, when I was a kid growing up in the 80s, short haul, short distance flights were really expensive. I remember my parents as a special anniversary treat flew to Paris. And I think their flight was like 400 pounds or something. And this was in the 80s. What? What? I don't know what that would be now. I guess the equivalent of a thousand or twelve hundred or something just to fly to the south of France. Well, as you know, you can now do that for 60 or 70 pounds or even less if you're early getting a deal. But it was accepted. It was the dogma. It was the um, status quo that you had to spend a lot of money flying on an airplane, that flying by plane was expensive and actually... Uh, air travel was the domain of, of the wealthy or the comfortable middle class. Outrageous. 
Anyway, so he's come in and he's challenged that. He's like, well, wait a minute. Why should flying around the world be expensive? Why don't we make it extraordinarily cheap? Why don't we make it as cheap as traveling by bus? <laughs> Which in some cases, a flight with Ryanair is certainly often cheaper than a train. Occasionally, it's cheaper than the bloody bus. And yet you're in the air. You are sitting on a seat inside a massive metal bird flying through the sky at 600 miles an hour and at 38,000 feet. Pretty spectacular. Amazing that that could be cheaper than the bus and of course quicker. So how did he do it? Well, he looked at the airline um, industry, he looked at the business model and he just identified every element in which he could save money. So obviously, you know, he, the employment contracts are different. So he's trying to pay the, the cabin crew less because that's how you save money. And then, you know, he's looking at buying, getting the best possible deal for, he buys the planes as cheap as he can. Now, none of that's all that innovative. But then he did some other crazy stuff, including getting people to pay for their meal. What? So before Ryanair, it was the norm that you would get a cooked meal on the plane. Now, this involves a lot of resource. They've got to have catering companies to produce the food. The food has a sell by date. Uh, the food has to be prepared, packaged, uh, shipped to the uh, to the airline and then, of course, stored in a refrigerated, uh, you know, in a fridge. I think that's how uh, that's how storing refrigerated things works is that they go into a fridge uh, and then heated up and prepared by the airline um, once it's um, once it's flying. Well, he just said, no, you're you're not getting a free meal. There is no free meal. And there was outrage. I, I beg your pardon. You're not going to give us a free meal. There's no cooked meal. But that was the dogma. That was the orthodoxy, which is you get on a plane. It's got to be expensive. And there's a hot meal with a roll and butter and nuts and a complimentary drink and all that stuff. And O'Leary's like, why bother with that? Uh, what if, what if you don't get a meal and the flight is cheaper? Would you rather be hungry and travel for less? And it turned out people did. So that's remarkable. That was revolutionary. He got rid of the free meal um, and actually he doubled his money because not only did he avoid the cost of preparing and serving food, and the hassle and the logistics and the man hours. But he's making money because now he is selling meals. So you can get sandwiches and crisps and drinks, but he's charging money. So he hasn't just saved, he's actually gained. What does he do with that money? Well, he's able to make the flights even cheaper. So we're going from a thousand pounds for a short haul flight. And it's already starting to come down to 500, 400, 300. And what was the next game changer? Well, the next game changer is he decided that you would pay to bring your bag. What? I beg your pardon. What? Yes, indeed. O'Leary, revolutionary. Um, he decided, why do we why do we carry these big heavy bags on the plane, which use a lot of jet fuel and which take up a lot of space and add to the costs for the airline? And of course, the logistics of getting that bag into the plane via conveyor belts and all the rest of it. So he said to the public, here's what you can do. You can basically travel just with a tiny bag, which has got your underpants or your knickers and your toothbrush and toothpaste and the sunglasses and your passport. And that's it. You're going to travel light. But if you travel light, I will reward you because I will take um, I will take what, what it would have cost to carry your bag. And I'll give you that money back in the form of a cheaper fare. So that's it. You don't get a free meal. If you want food, you have to pay for it. You don't get to take your bag on for nothing. If you want to bring a heavy bag, you will pay. And it's quite expensive. I mean, it's I think each way you're looking at 30 or 40 pounds. No, I think it's about I think it's about 30 pounds to take a bag now with you each way, which will be 60 for both for both ways. So that's what O'Leary did. He changed the game by looking at every aspect of the airline business and seeing how he could make it more efficient, how he could break the rules and how he could change the script. Take that business model, challenge the orthodoxy and turn it on its head. Another great example, James Dyson, the great British inventor and engineer, the man behind the Dyson vacuum cleaner. Now, this is a guy that was using a regular vacuum cleaner, which had a bag, and he found the bag disgusting because it 
fills up and you've got to empty it, which is a hassle. When you empty it, it's a disgusting process. All of that horrible gunk goes back into your lungs because you pull the bag out and it's all dusty and you're breathing all that in and it's like you've got to touch that all those germs don't you think handling a full bag of a vacuum cleaner is just the most unhygienic and disgusting thing to do you know that there are millions of dust mites in your home and they all go into that bag and when you empty the bag you're puffing them back into your face and breathing them in absolute horror as well as by the way all of those dead human skin cells because that's what a lot of dust is yuck so he just thought it was disgusting that you had to handle the bag by the way the bags were an ongoing cost the vacuum cleaner companies are very clever because a five pack of those bags could cost you 20 pounds which is ridiculous and that's how they keep making their money is making the bags expensive you also don't always know when the bag is full and if the bag is full the suction is not as good and don't forget that you are when you vacuum clean with a with the vacuum cleaner that's got a bag in it some of that dust is coming back out again because it passes the air goes into the device and it comes back out and it's going to pass through that yucky yucky dust um, and you'll know that because i mean we do have an old vacuum cleaner and when we use it the house actually smells whilst we're using it it's not a good sign is it it's not a ringing endorsement so he did not like the bag and he thought why don't i invent a vacuum cleaner that's got no bag bagless and all you do is when it's full which you can see because it will be a transparent barrel within within the device itself you can just see the dust when you see it's full you pull it out take it to the bin and ideally outside you just shake it into the bin and uh, the bagless vacuum cleaner it seems so obvious doesn't it no loss of suction you can see the dust you know when it's full it's clean no ongoing cost with the bags right this guy has thought outside the box he's challenged the orthodoxy well he took it to big businesses like hoover and said would you um adopt my technology and they said no uh, the public like a bag the bag is how it works that's what vacuum cleaners are a vacuum cleaner is suction and it's a bag that is the business and you will have no success with this go away so they rejected his idea of the bagless vacuum cleaner so he had no choice but to go and do it himself which of course was a gift because it meant he would own the ip the intellectual property and he would get the ultimate profit and now of course he's a billionaire so he's very lucky that hoover said no but does that tell you about how people think that the status quo is always something people are protective of that this is how we've always done it an innovator like dyson comes along they think he's mad they think he's an idiot sometimes these people get attacked and vilified as bonkers or dangerous but that is uh that is what he did he stuck to his guns he then started to um get this thing made and it became successful well guess what happened hoover did a bagless vacuum cleaner themselves even after they've said no to his technology they saw the success he had and they went and made a bagless uh, there was a court case and in the end he he sued james dyson sued hoover for theft of copyright the bottom line is that dyson won the argument but this was his innovation it was by turning the rules on their head by challenging orthodoxy so that's something you've got to do every day of your life is i mean sometimes the status quo is good you know human history there's a lot of stuff like democracy and free speech and we've got those and we've had them a long time and that's because they work and they're good um, people of a religious nature will go back to the quran or the bible or whatever the religious scripture is and it works for them and it's been tested through centuries of human history no problem but um there is nothing is sacred nothing is beyond critique nothing is beyond revision nothing is beyond revolution and so just have a think in your life you know in your job and generally as you go about your business um, are you thinking outside the box are you being creative are you challenging orthodoxy are you breaking the rules there you go break the rules you know that great catchphrase it's one of my favorites rules are there to be broken break them baby uh, don't do it for the sake of it but do it uh, when you think that something's not working it's like well you know that's the albert einstein line isn't it 
Um, the definition of madness is doing the same thing over and over again and accepting, uh, expecting a different outcome. Well, um, he is absolutely right, but that's what all human beings do. We, we plow on. So, you know, the manufacturers of vacuum cleaners with their bags, you know, it's, it's inadequate. It's, it's substandard. It's annoying. And yet they did it for years and years and years, these vacuum cleaners with the bags. Somebody comes along, takes a bit of courage, by the way, to break the rules, takes some commitment and you will get pushback. It's like people who drop truth bombs are always attacked. People that are revolutionary and want to do things differently will also experience resistance. So you've got to be prepared for that. You've got to push back on that baby. I've seen it myself in the field of low carb, as you will notice from an earlier episode of the show, and, and there will be future episodes as well. I'm a massive fan of the low carbohydrate way of eating, which means that you don't eat bread and pasta and rice and sugar. And that means that your insulin is lower and that means you burn fat and you get thin and you stay thin. It works brilliantly for me. I'm not a doctor. Consult your doctor at all times. But um, the low carb movement has been vilified in the media within the medical establishment. They're saying, oh, you're eating all that meat and fish and butter and dairy, and you're going to have a massive heart attack. Well, that is a very necessary and welcome debate to have, which is about whether saturated fat is actually directly linked to heart disease or not. Uh, let me reiterate, I am not an expert, but the push for low fat has seen global obesity rates exponentially rise since we changed the dietary guidelines. So there you go. It's all about challenging the orthodoxy. Let me give you another example, IKEA. Now, IKEA, in the way that Ryanair democratized air travel, IKEA democratized home furnishings. Because before IKEA, as with Ryanair, Home furnishings were just an expensive thing and you had to accept that. And if you did have cheap home furnishings, cheap sofas, cheap beds, they were going to be absolutely horrific. OK, they were going to be really low quality. And I grew up with some very low quality furniture at times. So we all did. Furniture in the 70s and 80s was absolutely awful. Unless you spent a lot of money, there was there was a lot of crap going on there. So what IKEA did is thought, well, no, what we'll do is um, we will allow the public to have very premium, high quality home furnishings and we will sell it remarkably cheaply. So how did they do that? Well, they got you to build it yourself. Now, this was unheard of before, before IKEA. Um, but of course, they could save a lot of money because you would just have the individual components of, let's say, a table or a chair in a box, neatly stored with thousands of other boxes in a warehouse, which is obviously, I mean, that, that, that's the great innovation of of, of, uh, of of IKEA is that the the shops are, are essentially just warehouses, aren't they? That's what it is. It's not a shop. It's a warehouse. And it's got these objects in it and you buy it, you drive. You, so IKEA would be out of town where the land is cheaper and where there's more space for a big car park and everything. The building is not pretty. It's basically a massive shed. You go in and you've got a pick the chair up yourself. You've got to put it on the trolley. You've got to now scan it yourself, right? There's no one around. And, and then you take it home in your car. So you've got to deliver it yourself. You're the delivery person. And then you've got to assemble it with instructions and an Allen key. This was unheard of to get people to build their own furniture. But it was genius. It allowed people to buy very high quality furniture because, you know, they're using great real materials, oak wood and everything, and um, just yeah, good components. I mean, the quality of IKEA is high and they've achieved that high quality, low cost by getting you to build the damn thing yourself and go and collect it yourself. Um, the other thing that IKEA do, which is very smart, and it's a little bit like the, the uh, clothing shop Primark here in the UK and Ireland, which is that IKEA have a kind of bulk mentality. So if they specify, if they design a certain kind of chair, they will commission absolutely tens of thousands of them, the same chair, just enormous volume 
of a slightly smaller range of things. I mean, they do have good choice at IKEA, but it's not an enormously massive choice. So for example, their mirrored wardrobes, the doors will fit any of the wardrobes. Everything is uniform, the dimensions are the same, so you can mix and match. It's almost like a jigsaw puzzle or, or, or Lego or something. So everything is interchangeable and everything is quite monolithic. And that's why, so so the same with, with Primark. Primark will have quite a limited range of, of, of jeans. And then they'll just, they, they can go to a supplier and go, we want 300,000 pairs of this particular shade of blue in jeans. Go make them in all the different sizes. And they can just sit in the warehouse for years until they're sold. So that's, a, that's, that's how they do it, is sort of bulk buying, bulk commission, um, churn them out thick and fast. So that is really, really amazing. And that's what IKEA did and their stuff. I, I reckon that we're surrounded by IKEA things here in this room. And it's changed the world and I love them for it. I find them, there's something very democratic about IKEA. It was the same with Apple. I mean, Apple broke the rules in so many ways. Um, one thing that Apple did, first of all, Steve Jobs, who founded Apple, he didn't like PCs because when you switch them on, you get all this code on the screen. He's like, why is there that code there? I don't want to see the code. So Apple just scrapped that. They scrapped, scrapped the code. Um, you had a device called a floppy disk in the 70s and 80s. And Steve Jobs thought they were rubbish and it was time to upgrade how you put information into a computer. So he, he got rid of the, the floppy disk. The industry was an uproar. You won't sell any computers if it doesn't have a floppy disk drive. And he said, I know, but it's it's the wrong technology. It's outdated. And the only way we're going to get people to move to CD-ROM is if we just don't make the floppy disk drive anymore. So he just, he took that away from customers. Customers like, oh, we like the floppy disk. He's like, you're not getting it. Our computers, you're not allowed. We're going to make computers and you do not get a floppy disk drive. You only get a DVD drive. And then what happened? People started using the CD DVD drive instead. And then what to do? After a few years, uh, the DVDs and the CDs become defunct. Apple, get rid of it again. You're, lo you're not getting, you're not getting the DVD drive. We're taking it away from you. You're going to buy this computer and you're not having that thing that you say you want. Why? Because everything's in the cloud now. And they've been bold. They've been ahead of the game. Now, other computer companies kept producing laptops with the DVD drive because some people say they still want it. Apple are like, bit of leadership. No, you ain't getting it. We don't believe in it. We are getting rid of it. Um, I think at some point Apple will get rid of the cable that charges your phone. They'll get rid of it. It'll just be wireless and people will complain. But that's leadership and it's challenging the orthodoxy and going that that thing's old and rubbish. Get rid. And it will be a painful transition, but let's do it. So what you've got with Apple, with Ikea, with Ryanair is a bold vision, a ruthless scrutiny of the business model, efficiency, lean, unforgiving, courageous. All of those companies are successful. So why don't you be a bit more Ikea? Why don't you be a bit more Ryanair? Why don't you be a bit more Apple? And that, by the way, is very much what this show is about. It's about hacking your life. And so if we, for example, from a previous show, one of my favorite three word um, messages is do bad work. And I just think that unlocks everything. You know, when you're sort of stuck with something and you're like, uh, do it badly, just do it, actually actively do it badly. And then it's done. And you'll find that once you've done it, it's not that bad at all. Do bad work. So you, that is what we're doing in this podcast is we're going to try to, I'm trying to change your life and revolutionize your life. And the way we're going to do it is to do what IKEA, Apple and Ryanair di did, which is to look at things and see how we can make them better and break the rules along the way. Your friends won't believe it. They'll think you're mad. I mean, I started barefoot walking a while ago. People think I'm crazy, but it's been great for my health. Gives me energy. Lovely. I went low carb. People are like, that'll kill you. Are you mad? I lost three stone. Felt fantastic. Happy days. Break those rules. Now, how are we doing? Right. Let's, um, let's talk about some other really important things. My product of the day. I'm going to go for apple cider vinegar. Absolutely delicious. A very cheap ingredient and it is 
Uh, my favorite kind, if you can get organic, that's lovely. Uh, but the big one is to get with the mother. So it's unpasteurized and unfiltered. This brand, um, if you're listening, let me tell you that it's Biona. But any good apple cider vinegar, unpasteurized, unfiltered with the mother is the apple cider vinegar to have. Now, why is it good? Well, it matches the pH in your gut. So if you have a little apple cider vinegar, um, if you have, let's say, a couple of tablespoons uh, mixed with a glass of water, it will restore the acid balance in your stomach. So it's an ancient food or drink, if you like. It's completely natural and it's good for your gut. Um, I actually like to make a drink with my apple cider vinegar and I find it very energizing. I go for sparkling water, about an inch of apple cider vinegar at the top. I, I like it really strong, but each to their own. So um, let's say it's two thirds. No, let's say it's let's say it's three quarters water, a quarter apple cider vinegar. I like that strength, but adjust to your own taste. And then I add a couple of drops of stevia, which is a natural sweetener, which you can get on Amazon or in your local health food shop, um, which is completely sugar free. It's a natural sweetener. We'll do a special on sweeteners soon. Water, apple cider vinegar and then stevia. Mix them together. And that is a delicious sugar-free soft drink, which is good for your gut, gives you energy, and it's a beautiful thing. Now, what's really nice about apple cider vinegar is that there are some medics, including the popular US YouTube medic, Dr. Ken Berry, who's a, a board-certified physician in the States, and he recommends apple cider vinegar as a treatment for acid reflux. Now, why would that be? Why on earth would you add something as acidic as apple cider vinegar to somebody that's got acid reflux? Surely you're feeding the monster. Uh, well, GERD or acid reflux, um, as it's known, uh, is in the view of some caused by a lack of acid in your stomach. And the, the principle of it is that because your stomach is not acidic enough, the valve in your uh, in your digestive system doesn't close properly and therefore the certain amount of acid that's in your gut starts to creep creep up and what happens is that if your gut is very acidic then the valve closes okay so acidic gut creates this pressure closes the valve and then you don't get the reflux now if you've got acid reflux consult your doctor i'm not an expert okay i'm just this guy but it's worked for me and I think it's worth a try because the alternative for acid reflux is endlessly having antacid and taking medication to stop your stomach producing acid. Well, I've got news for you. Your body, your stomach is supposed to produce acid. In your gut, you have hydrochloric acid. And not only does that achieve sort of the, the, the pH balance within your body, but it helps you digest food, especially protein. So if you eat a steak or something like that, and if you're then uh, having, if you eat protein, if you have a steak and your gut is not acidic enough, you'll have trouble breaking that protein down. That's not good, is it? So you want a nice acidic stomach. It tends to happen that when you get older, your gut gets less acidic. So apple cider vinegar, a natural fix for that. If you've got acid reflux, give it a go. Um, I find acid uh, apple cider vinegar very good uh, for, for dinner. And I will just take a shot straight before I eat because I just feel that I'm preparing my gut for digestion. And that would be, I take it, this is quite quite a lot, okay? This would be too much for many people. But I have, imagine more like a double whiskey. I have about that much of the apple cider vinegar down in one. Pretty bracing, pretty, uh, a pretty um, arresting physical experience. Just oh, neat and strong. But there you go, apple cider vinegar, my product of the day. Also, a, largely a pretty cheap ingredient as well completely natural give it a go do you want that or do you want a load of pills you tell me you should run to your fear if you're afraid of something it's because actually it's your destiny the brilliant actor michael kane said you become what you fear and i will never forget the time when i went to a comedy gig as a youngster and i watched these comedians and for some reason even though i was just watching sitting in the audience i was absolutely terrified and it's because I'm watching these people thinking, I think I've got to do this. I think this is what I want to do. 
So Michael Caine said it very wisely, you become what you fear. So if there's something that you're afraid of, it's probably the thing that you should be doing and are going to do. So listen to that fear and pursue it. Feel the fear and do it anyway. Once a day, remember earlier, do one thing, right? Just do one thing. Each day, just do one thing. Like I'm just going to be on time today. I don't have to be perfect in any other way, but I will nail being on time. Tomorrow, I'm going to be friendlier. On Wednesday, I'm not going to buy my nails. Just each day, just have a, here's the thing I'm going to do today. Um, <clears throat> one day, one of those days, why don't you just um, pursue fear, right? You just have to, on Wednesday, I'm going to just do things I'm afraid of. That'll be my thing. Or at least one, I'll do one thing I'm afraid of. And suddenly, once you've done it, you're not afraid anymore. And it will give you huge self-confidence. So run to your fear. Um, also, work-life balance is very important and very good. And you should work very hard, but in a very focused and sustainable way. So I've talked about intermittent fasting on this show, and that involves just eating within a time window, which is, in my case, from about midday to 8 p.m. Don't eat outside of those hours, and that gives your body many hours outside of those eight hours, 16 hours, in which to not eat and just digest the food and let your organs rest and recover. That's intermittent fasting. Well, try intermittent working where you just decide I will have an intense two hours and then I will stop and I will not work. OK, and it's just we're working because what a lot of people do in offices all day for like 10 hours is kind of working and not working. And it's all a blur and it's depleting. They're sitting in the office. They're using energy. The office is not normally the nicest environment. You've got artificial lighting, you've got people around you. It's noisy. So what you want, I used to work with this brilliant guy, brilliant producer in radio. And he, well, he was called Robert and he worked the fewest hours of anyone. He'd, he'd come in in the morning, nine o'clock, and he just would hit it hard. Attack, attack, attack. Three o'clock. He was out of there. Now, he was quite senior. So he could get away with just like leaving the office early. But there were other people that would sit there till six, seven, eight o'clock at night. But this guy, Robert, is like, I'm, if I'm done at three, if my work's done, I'm out of here. But what this guy did between nine and three or even between nine and 12 was so much more potent and useful than what the other people were doing for 10 hours. And this is because this guy was an adopter of effectively intermittent working. By the way, I'm, I've just invented that intermittent working is mine. But you could have it. What's mine is yours. Don't forget that. We are a family. So intermittent working is good. But when you're working, you're concentrated, you do it, and then boom, you're off. So on, off, on, off. Really, really clear boundaries. And let me tell you about boundaries. Some of the most successful people in the world do not work the longest hours. In fact, they might work the fewest. I'll give you a few examples. So first of all, what about... Larry David and Jerry Seinfeld, who created Seinfeld, which was the most successful, is the most successful sitcom in the history of television. Larry David had worked on Saturday Night Live, which is another iconic American show. But they had this tradition of working very, very long hours. And I think the day before the, the live show, they just wouldn't go to bed. The writers would be up all night. And that was a tradition. And they equated pulling all all nighter with commitment to the cause. And, you know, it's like we don't sleep because we're going to make the show better. Larry David was not very impressed by this, but that was the culture of the show. So when he finally got his sitcom commissioned with Jerry Seinfeld, they both agreed they were not going to do that nonsense because there were other sitcoms, too, where they would just have these crazy hours, 14, 16, 18 hours. And everyone thinks they're such a hero because they've had no sleep. And it's like a, a marathon session, a competition to see who can stay up the longest. Absolute nonsense. You're going to get ill. You're going to get burned out. And is it going to make the comedy better? I don't think so. Well, neither did Jerry Seinfeld, neither did Larry David. So they decided that, that their program would be made in office hours. OK, so nine till six, we get in the morning, we drink coffee, we do the table read, we add extra jokes, we record. But they made that show, the biggest show in history, in office hours. And that's why they were able to have nine series and 
hundreds of episodes because it was sustainable and it was focused and the work was better. The same with Elton John. Now, Elton John will often get a mention on this show because he happens to be my musical hero and I consider him to be an extraordinary human being as well. I'm obsessed with Elton John. A, a, a truly, truly great man. But um, efficient as hell, this man. Efficient as hell. He wrote Candle in the Wind in 24 minutes. What? He wrote Don't Go Breaking My Heart, I believe, according to his guitarist, uh, Davy Johnstone, in a quarter of an hour. And OK, he's he's blessed with a God given gift and all of that. And I'm not saying that you can do the equivalent of write a song in half an hour. But what this guy does is he gets his lyrics. He doesn't mess around. He's like he hits it hard. Elton John, the originator of intermittent creativity. Right. Just create, create, create intense, intense, intense. And then nothing. And by the way, don't interrupt this guy when he's writing, because this is like a red hot furnace now burning away burning creativity and he has been i would suggest successful and he is very strict about um you know his working patterns and once he has done the piano playing in the studio and he's put his vocal down he's out of there he's out of there and he leaves it to the producer to then fiddle with levels and add sound effects and whatever, turn the drums up, turn the guitar down and produce the thing. And he's out of there and he's made his contribution and he knows he can go just like my friend Robert, who would leave the office at lunchtime or even mid afternoon. So it's focused work. Make it count while you're there. Um, there is a brilliant book called The Four Hour Working Week by Tim Ferriss. That's all you need to know. You could potentially some people and it's, it's, it's a lucky minority. I'm not one of them, but some people can get everything they need to done in four hours. It's pretty extreme in a week. Sorry, what? But see, look at your work patterns and your workflows, especially if you're self-employed and see how you can just crunch it down. On my TV show, I have gone from, you know, the prep has been in the past eight, nine hours before I even get on air. And I've crunched that right down because, yes, I'm, I'm trying to make it better by spending that long working on it. But I get on air and then I'm like, I'm already... I've used my energy. So I've got to save it for the show. So I deliberately really make the show slightly worse so that I can have a better performance on the night. It's just not practical. You've got a certain amount of energy. So use it in a focused way. Like like with Seinfeld. Yes, if they'd stayed till nine o'clock, maybe they could have got an extra couple of good jokes. But it's better for everyone to get out at six or seven and have a life. That is in the long run better. And you know that while you're there, you just do good work. Um, but remember, do bad work is good as well. Uh, the other example of that is Woody Allen. Now, Woody Allen, a very, very successful filmmaker who is famous for insisting on filming in New York, even if the movie is set in a different part of America. And the reason why is because he likes to go to a certain restaurant in Manhattan um, after you know, at the end, at the end of a long day of work, he wants to be with his family. He wants to film in the same city in which he lives. Why? Because that is sustainable. It's a better work life balance. It has not affected his career, which has been a stellar one. He's had the perfect film career. I mean, he's been mired in controversy for other reasons, but creatively, no one can question the quality of this guy's output. He also, and he said it in a podcast interview recently, that he has knowingly allowed certain films to be worse because he wanted to go to a baseball game. So he's filming some scenes and he's like, we have to stop at six because I'm going to see um, a baseball game. And they could do that scene one more time, but he's like, well, I'm going to watch sport. <laughs> okay. So we'll just, we'll just take what we've got, which isn't as good. And I'll see you tomorrow. Amazing. Now, that's surprising and counterintuitive, isn't it? But it's led to some of the greatest films ever made. If you want a good recommendation for a Woody Allen film, Manhattan are considered to be his masterpiece. Husbands and Wives, a late masterpiece and a brilliant early comedy, Bananas or Love and Death. There you go. But there, you know, a lot of them are good. So I think I think that's us. Um, I've really enjoyed chatting to you today. I hope you're well revise all the things we've talked about, go back, but remember that you're just going to do tomorrow or even today, if you want now, from, from the moment that this podcast stops, 
Just decide that you, there's one thing that you're going to do between now and the time you go to bed. Okay, one, one mentality, one approach or one task and just make that the thing and keep it singular and you'll find it gives you momentum and changes your life, which is what this show is all about. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.